Yo, this hot, this the spot, there it is, pod.com. We're interviewing the best comedians, so tune in quick and get your ears receiving them. We're talking about life and life to stream right to you from the microphone right to your home, dude. Side note, this might get embarrassing, but no, don't sweat, yo, because there it is. Yo, this is Welcome to the There It Is Podcast, a comedy podcast for creators of any variety. I'm your host, Jason Farr. Let's do this. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed last week's Bob Ross episode. Got some good feedback on that. Thanks for listening. We have some fun pictures on the website, thereitispod.com. If you go to the blog section and look up the Bob Ross episode, you can see those fun pictures. Fun episode today. I do want to mention something. Uh, Justina and I are lucky enough to live within walking distance of three really great venues. Um, and that's Littlefield, Bell House, Halyards. They all have comedy acts. And uh, they're great shows. All the shows that we've seen at each of those venues have been great. And, they, and they've been cheap. Uh, we saw for $10 the other day, we saw a show that had... A lot of great talent, many of them we were not familiar with, but on the show was Julio Torres, who's famous for writing for SNL and his stand-up is great. Talk about original thought. This this act, I mean, th- Julio is fantastic. I mean, the stuff, I, I, he, uh, I don't even know how to talk about Julio Torres. Julio makes it look easy to do stand-up. And it's not at all. So that was really a great set. And also, one of my favorite acts is Cocoon Central Dance Team. I don't even know how to describe what it is they're doing. But they are amazing. And we saw them at the Bell House and on, on a Reductra show. And, um, you know, it's just great that we can see these shows. We're, we're really happy because it's, it's eye-opening and it's all a lesson. Uh, we learn more things when we see great shows, so it's it's really great to um, watch shows. So if you wherever you are, uh, there's Netflix. If you don't have a bunch of shows coming to your town, but live shows especially, try to get those in when you can because you will learn more about how to create stuff and how to just be on stage, and you'll you'll learn a lot. So go uh, go to as many shows as you can. Um, Speaking of that kind of stuff, I'm very rusty at improv right now because um, my last class at Magnet ended on Halloween and our first class, as we mentioned in last week's episode, started, or not first class, but next class, the, the next class that I've taken since that one that ended on Halloween, as we mentioned last week, started last week and super rusty. And then we are also doing this thing um with the magnet called the circuit and we met for the first time with that team that we were put on last night and again incredibly rusty it's like did i forget how to do improv did i forget what being funny even is i don't know what's going on but um you know i gotta bounce back i gotta get back into it i gotta get my head in the game because i didn't come up here to like be rusty and stink (laughs) make a fool out of myself this show today. Uh, It's with one of my best friends, and uh, it's, listen, last week you saw Bob Ross. He can't have Bob Ross on the show. And uh, now this week, it's Jim Hendrix. You're like, wait a minute, what? So, um, (laughs) there's, uh, listen, I did not have two dead people on the show. This is a living person, and uh, it's a great talk. Why don't we just get right to it? Here's my chat with Jim Hendrix. Let's set the table for people because, you know, I haven't had a ton of musicians on, but let's explain to them why you were on. You were, yes, you have a famous name. But we're best friends, so you just... we're also best friends. (laughs) (laughs) But you're a musician, and you're on a major label, and, you know, you're you're touring around the the world now, right? Yeah, man, so um, obviously my background is music. Uh, I studied music at Winthrop. You know, but I was a uh, doing opera, right? Um, so uh, it's a little bit of a change, obviously. Yeah, so let's talk about that. You and I met. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When I met you, um, your uh, your bass player, 
but you were singing opera. Yep. And then you started a funk band in college. Yep. Oh, yeah. Uh, and now you're a bassist for a country artist. Yep, that's right. Yeah, now I'm Adam playing Craig. for Adam Craig. Yeah, so, um, man, I moved up to Nashville in 2006, and uh, I really didn't know what I was going to get into. But I, I knew that, I, you know, I knew I wanted to do music. Um but I wasn't really sure, you know, all the, all the guys that I'd been playing with back in South Carolina, you know, we had talked about moving, but none of them, uh, ultimately made the move with me. And so I came up here by myself and, uh, you know, I, Adam, uh, and the guys at the time, uh, was a group called Telluride and, uh, I met them three months into moving here and started touring. And then it just kind of progressed over the years. You know, we had, you know, obviously 12 years to sum up, you know, we ended up having to change the name for lawsuit reasons and everything. And now it's Adam Craig and, uh, you know, Adam, it's been, it'll be 12 years in May. My dog is, it's easy. He's all hung up on some cables. I should probably clean my cables up. Um, 12 years in May. Yeah. So it's been a long time, man. But, uh, you know, yeah, the last few years have been, um, really cool. A lot of fun. Yeah, uh, but, it's, but a you know, lot it's, of hard work, of course. But it, it is, you know. Let's go, ahead. go back to when you moved out there. I mean, you said you went out there alone, and we have friends who've moved moved out places. Uh, Toby Morell was on previously in this podcast, right. and but he had a group that he moved out to see across the country with, and right. Uh, but I still Paul don't Vignair, think who was on a couple weeks ago, moved out yeah. across the country with a group of people. But you went right. alone. Yeah, so, uh, you know, well, I, the good thing is I had a, have a great support of friends at the time back home that were, you know, had my back. And, you know, so even though I was alone here, I did know a few people here. Um, one, the drummer from my funk band, Phonic Fusion, Greg Dampier, was living here at the time. Um, so I knew a few people. Um, and it was – and the cool thing about living in Nashville is – that it's a really cool community, even back then, because you know Nashville, you know it's a music city, but it was a really close knit group of people. So, you know, I started meeting people, and, and they started introducing me to their friends, and you know they knew that I was looking for work, and so they started introducing me to people who were looking for a bass player, and you know it really wasn't hard initially to find some gigs just to get my foot in the door. So yeah, it was hard. I, I was alone, but. Uh, it some sometimes that that may have proved to be advantageous for me just because unlike Toby with Emory they, they were a group so you know these guys aren't taking side gigs to make money they're trying to get their name back in the day out in Seattle yeah. uh, you know they're trying to get their name out there well me I was like well I don't I just need to play right. so I was I was willing to play and I was willing to play for whatever they could pay me at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's kind of how I got started. And then, you know, luckily I found uh, Adam and the guys pretty pretty early on. And, um, you know, there's there's something about it, man. It, one of those things that it's an intangible. You, you don't know what it is and why you keep sticking around because God knows we've talked about it. You know, Adam and I were talking about this. We were in Mexico last week and it was like, man, you know, there, there were times that, you know, we thought that, man, if this doesn't work, we're just going to we'll all go back home and get a regular job because it's, it's not as hard. It's not yeah. as hard to find a regular job. It's, um, but I'm glad we held out, you know, there I was with my wife and Adam hanging out on the beach in Mexico last week, uh, right before we had to play a show on the beach, you know, pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty cool. I'm glad we stuck it out. Yeah. I'm glad too. Cause it's been great to see all your hard work pay off. Yeah. And, um, I remember at the time when you moved out there, I mean, like you said, you, you were there three months and you met some of the people that you're playing with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, it was through connections that you got there. Right. Um, you know, meeting somebody, playing for people, mm-hmm. impressed some people, and you are like, yeah, man, I just got lucky. And there is luck involved. And I've talked yeah. about this recently. Of course, luck is involved. But I told you at the time, but also, man, you're good. And you've been working hard to get good. I mean, right. I don't know how many times I went past. I was your uh, this for the audience. I was <laughs> Jim's RA. <laughs> That's how we met. I was his RA, and I don't know how many times. I walk, yeah, yeah, I don't <laughs> know how many times I walked past your room, and you're just playing the bass, or how many times yeah. you were hanging out 
in an apartment and you would go to the back of your room and all of a sudden we'd hear you playing your bass and like we're just <laughs> hanging out we're in the middle of a conversation perhaps i was a little obnoxious about it then <laughs> no, uh these not. days I, you know i got all my all my gear kind of sitting around here but i mean it's it's it sits a lot, you know, be, now I'm a dad. So it's, yeah. you know, if you I got some downtime, yeah. Um, now I do, get, I do practice and I, you know, especially when we're getting ready for tour, we'll go and yeah. spend a day or two in a rehearsal space and, and, and lock down a solid set for the tour. But, uh, yeah, man, I, I did practice a lot, but that's, you know, I've got buddies here in Nashville that, I mean, they're Nashville is a town of monster musicians. Everybody's oh, yeah. so good. I mean, you walk, it's, you go downtown. Nashville's known for obviously Broadway and the and the uh, the bars, the honky tonks. But dude, some of these guys down there, and they're and they're doing it seven nights a week, playing in these bars, and they're making a living doing it. Man, these guys are good, like yeah. real good. And you know that scene, the bar scene, just it, it's not for me. And I take nothing away from the guys who do that because one thing they're 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 all really good mm -hmm. secondly i mean they're making a living doing it it's just not the kind of scene that 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 is that i feel like it's for me i just get uh, a little anxiety anxious when i'm around like really tight small <laughs> buildings with lots of people also for the audience you're six eight so the, yeah the tight space is not a comfortable space for you yeah yeah i'm, I'm a i'm a big guy i'm <laughs> six eight 260 pounds and you know just I, I don't fit into small places very well. So, um, but yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's hard work, but then, you know, when you, you look at it and I'm sure you do the same thing with, with comedy, it's, it's, it's a business. So, I mean, you, you've got to have the talent, the talent has to be there. Yeah. So I, I think that I'm, I think that I'm good enough to, to play with any band in Nashville. Uh, but then, you also you got to be a good hang man. That's that's the other thing too. You've got to be a really you got to be good to get along with. And you be um, on the bus with the with each other for a long time. If somebody doesn't yeah. like spending time with you, they're not going to hire you. Like if they're just right. having an an interview with you and they just feel a bad vibe from you or just think right. you're a jerk, yeah, you're, then they're not going to yeah, hire you. At the end of the day, when you when you've done your job, which is performing you still got to be with these people i mean you can go to your bunk and you can you can close the curtain and and hide out but i mean you do spend a lot of time with each other and yeah. uh, so it's it's different than your regular job is in that you're you're with these people 24 hours a day sometimes two three four weeks at a time in a tight um, space on yeah the bus it's not yeah. as glamorous as people think it is maybe no it's, it's intimate times too i mean oh, it's like yeah. we're sleeping in bunk beds on a bus, like that's yeah, that's, bouncing down the that's highway. Close. It's, it's a little closer than your other cohort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you definitely uh, you see a lot of butts. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of you know you're you're changing in there a lot of times. If we're at a club that doesn't necessarily have a big enough green room, we'll just change on the bus so we don't have to bring our clothes in. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, you know, being out on the tour last year, there was plenty of green rooms for us to hang out, and so we were spending all our time in in the the bigger green rooms, but yeah, you spend a lot of time with each other and, uh, you, you, it's, it's great because if you get along, I mean, we're, there's, there's five guys in the, in the band and myself and Adam Craig and our keyboard player, Ryan Jones, we've been together the longest and, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan, Ryan is Adam's first cousin. So they've been together forever, but Ryan joined, uh, about six months after I joined when we were in Nashville. So Ryan, Ryan and me, Ryan and Adam, uh, almost 12 years. It'll be 12 years in May for wow. me. So uh, we've spent um, years, literally years together, rooming together in a, in a van or a bus now. And uh, you, you learn what makes people tick. You know what, uh, learn, you learn what pisses each other off. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've all had our moments where we've kind of gotten, you know, had our, you know, outbursts or, or been kind of like, dude, you know, calm down you're you're you know we never had any big fights you have an argument here and there but mm -hmm. at the end of the day we're, we're all really good friends and there's nothing that's ever left that's like man this guy really sucks i mean i, I right. generally love all the guys in the group and um you know for spending that much time together you know i think people would assume that when we come home we don't talk we don't do anything and, and yeah we might we might go some time without seeing each other but we're, we're always kind of staying in touch and we're always you right. know seeing what's what's going on and um 
yeah, I mean, we're just, yeah, it's a close, it's a family. I mean, yeah, I mean, like people liken a lot of, a lot of entertainers have likened being in the industry sometimes to doing a tour of, uh, you know, like in the military. Like, and, yeah. you know, obviously there's a big difference right. in like uh, what li- the lifestyle looks like. But what they are talking about is we're with each other all the time yeah. in these tight spaces and uh, we grow a bond, a specific bond in that. And sometimes it can be hard to even go home. People are so used to being on the bus or, you know, like in the trenches. It can be one of those things. It's definitely like uh, after a few weeks you get home and, you know, the weird sleep patterns and and things like that. And then your first couple of nights home, you're in your own bed. You're just like, "Eh." yeah, I feel like I, you know, (laughs) should be moving or going somewhere. It's, you know, it is kind of tough to wind down, but I mean, I, I I always look forward to coming home now. Um, Mm -hmm. even if I'm only gone for a day or two, um, you know, I've I've got a wife that's pretty awesome, and, and I've got my three three and a half year old little girl. She's almost four, and uh, I can't believe it. I, I know, man. And uh, so I, um, yeah, it, that's what always keeps me. Like it's like after a day or two, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to get home and see my girls. You know, we were in, like last week, we were gone, um, and it was the first time that my wife and I had been able to get away for just the two of us for a few days because she came with us to Mexico. And it was the first time we'd both have been away for from our from our daughter at the same time for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's the second time. But we, <laughs> we're in a different country, so it was much yeah, we were, you know, twenty five hundred miles away instead of a few hundred miles away. Um, so it was you know we both it was fine. It was, my daughter had a great time. I don't think she missed us <laughs> that much because she was with my grandparents or her grandparents. Um, but you know, after a few days, you're like, all right, I'm ready to get home see see Nora yeah. uh, so uh, you know yeah there's there's never a time that I'm like man I wish I could stay out for a few more weeks I love playing I love doing the thing right. I love going on tour so I'm always excited to play shows but I'm always looking forward to to being home that's a good balance to have where neither yeah. is getting annoying yeah exactly and I know guys that there are some people and I, and I think it's unhealthy sometimes that they they always want to be on the road. They they only mm-hmm. look, care about. They want to go out. They don't care who it's with or where it, where they're going. They'll they'll want to go. And yeah. even if they've got a family, they're they're itching to get out. And you know it's good to play, but you got to. I mean, to to me, you know, family is the most important thing. Right. Uh, and careers come and go, and 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 hopefully that I'll be able to stick this one out for another twelve or twenty years. And, um, that would be awesome. That's what I'm hoping for. But, you know, at the end of the day, your family is, is, is what has supported you, you know, the whole time. And Nick, before we were married, you know, she supported me through this when, when I was broke, you know, didn't have enough money, barely had enough money to pay rent sometimes. And, you know, she was, she was cool about the tough times. And so, I mean, for somebody to, to stick with me through that, pretty awesome. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, that reminds me of a line from the new U2 album that Bono is singing about his wife as the song called Landlady. I don't know if you've heard it, but in the in that he says, I didn't know what starving poets meant because when I was broke, it was you that always paid the rent. And he's talking Mm -hmm. about that time period where they were starting out as a band and yep. they were struggling, but they were sticking with it. And she was that support system. And she was right. the one who was always there. And that, you know, he's been with her since high school. And he's right. in his late 50s now. So he's been with her 40 some years or 40 years or something like that. And that's what he's singing about. Because that, that's right. what matters. You know, that's yeah. it's your family. That's the important thing. Man, it's totally true. And, um, you know, and it goes back to. You know, there's that whole stigma with musicians about, you know, running around with women on the road. And mm-hmm. and you did you know, meet Nick on the road. <laughs> I, I did, but it, but I, but you were was not, single at the time. I, I, I was single. And uh, <laughs> when we first met, she didn't want to have anything to do with me. I think it was it was quite a while before she'd even kiss me. So, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't some kind of one night stand led to a relationship. Right. It was, uh, you know, we, we slow played it and it, now, it was what long I knew distance. It was like. 
uh, you say she didn't want to have anything to do with you, but what I remember is like you just immediately saying like, oh, I met this girl, she's really cool, and it was like friends, but you were just like pretty immediately enamored with her. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. Um, so it turns out she was working. Her dad, she was still in college at the time. I, she was only she makes a year, two, she's two years younger than I am. Um, so and she you was finished twenty seven. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she. Uh, she um, was being her dad was making her work at this thing for a, a liquor company because her dad owns a liquor store and they were doing this advertisement thing. And she was at this place and started talking. I could tell she didn't really want to be there and we were just cracking jokes. And so then I, I asked her to go to dinner after we were done. And, and she was just like, I, no, I don't think so. And <laughs> oh, OK, well, that didn't work. And, but, but her friend was there and her friend said that she wanted to go. And so Nick Nick was like, okay, well, I'll go then. And it was a group thing. And then we just hit it off, and then we kind of never stopped hanging out after that. And it's, it's, I mean, it'll be also 12 years uh, in August. August 17th is when we met, the first time we ever met. Dang. Wow, so, 2018 yeah. a big year, at least in, as far as a dozen. <laughs> yeah. The big number. Yeah, exactly. So I met her the first year I was out on the road. Uh, with, with being, Our first year I was in Nashville, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, man, I mean, it's like one of those things going back to that. I, I did meet Nick on the road, but I wasn't in pursuit of some like crazy one night thing. It was just a, hey, you're yeah. cool. Let's go hang out and let's let's mm-hmm. have dinner. Let's let's see. Who, let's just talk. And it, what, there was no no strings attached, right. no expectations. And what was your thought that you because we didn't let you finish. <laughs> I didn't let you finish it with about uh, guys on the road with. Uh, oh, you know. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, th- there's always the temptation. It doesn't matter what kind of music you do or what you do, period. I mean, if you're. It, comedy music acting um you know people are are going to uh some people are really enticed by what they think you have as power or some sort of mm-hmm. uh social status because you're in a band or that you're touring you must be you know well known or whatnot and you know to some people that that is a, a big turn on and they'll they'll pursue you and sometimes it's aggressive mm-hmm. um and, um, and sometimes they're very beautiful people. And the thing is, is, you know, no, you've had a lot of guys will, will in their mind have this fantasy about all oh, this beautiful woman, you know, and, and she's going to change my life. And, you know, she, what if she's better than what I have at home? Well, the, the truth is, is you know, this, this woman's not really interested in you. You know, they're interested right. in, in, you have an idea about them. They, you have a fantasy about these people. Well, they have the same fantasy about you. Yeah. <laughs> they think that you're something that you're not. I mean, we're we're all guys that we come home and you know I hang out at my house all day and you know I'm I go to the gym and that's about it, man. And there's nothing special about what we do <laughs> except that I get to travel and, and play on some stringed instruments, you know, and I get yeah. paid. But there's nothing special. So you know, you, you both have these uh, unrealistic fantasies and you think that it's better than what you you may or may not have. Well, it's um, the grass is greener myth. Absolutely. You know, because the whole it's idea totally behind it. Yeah, it's totally a myth. Because, like, the idea is, like, once you have what the neighbor has, you realize then, like, for one, you're going to see something else that you want more. But it's going to be because you realize, oh, I got to do a bunch of work, even more work than I had to do in my original yard, you know? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. So, just, you know, that, it's, it's one of those things. And I, and I thought that I saw that early on, too, that just – um First of all, I'd seen it ruin people's lives. Yeah, uh, take really good people that I knew and and made them into people that I I didn't want to be around uh, because of that. Um, and you know, it's just not worth it. You know, one one night to hang out with somebody that you think you're, it, it's going to change your life or change your world, and it more than likely is not going to. It's right. never going to end up good. So, you know, you just. You, it's easy. It was always easy for me to stay grounded. And again, having this really good group of guys that I'm out on the road with, we're all, we're all like the same way, you know, it's, you know, we're all in relationships and we're all like really focused on, on our wives or girlfriends back home. Right. And so there's, you know, never any temptations to, to, you know, Hey, yeah, let them on the bus. No, <laughs> right. nobody, nobody gets on the bus unless they're us. <laughs> so, um, it's nice to have that that um, so kind of uh, I call it a support system. Um, no, that's good. You know, we're, we're not holding each other's hand, saying no, you're not going home with this person. But we all kind of know that hey, 
you know, we're, we're doing this. Uh, it's, um, one of those things for me that it's never been a, an issue. And, you know, I know what I have coming home to is, uh, is pretty awesome. So yeah. I would I never mean, want to. Uh, yeah. I, it, a lot of people have ruined good things because they got enticed by, uh, some myth, some fantasy that's in <laughs> their head. That's just not going to turn out that way. It's not going to turn out that way. It's not worth it. And, uh, you know, at the end of end of the day, if you want something good, you have to put the work into it. Absolutely. Um, and that's even to go back to what we were saying earlier. I mean, you put this work into getting better, and that's why you impressed people uh, as, <clears throat> as a musician. And now in this band, you've spent all these years, because I've, I've heard the stories, <laughs> because you've, right. we've been in touch about it, but you've talked about, like, the touring circuit, like how the radio touring circuit leads to something, something more. And uh, right. you all, as a band now, have been working hard. Can we talk a little bit about that process when someone's getting started out? And just like, yeah. not necessarily like, because I don't know how many musicians are, are listening, but just at least like mentally where someone has to be at during that time period. Yeah, so I, I think whether you're a band, artist, comedian it, it's all kind of the same i mean so and i'll basically start where when we signed the record deal when adam signed with uh, broken bow records stony creek records uh 2014 um that kind of was the game changer for us before that we did we had done radio tours we had done some shows but you know this was kind of the, the point where it's like okay now we're, we're stepping up um but man yeah it's 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 a it's a it's a hard hard road and it's a lot of learning curves for us it was a lot of a big learning curve for us you know um it's weird because so adam adam is obviously adam craig he's the front man he's the artist and adam and i have this relationship because we both wear a lot of hats in the group adam obviously the front man he's the guy that he's taking the meetings with the labels he's taking the meetings with our management company um and he he does a lot of the radio stuff and a lot of times he's out on this solo by himself mm -hmm. with a rep from the record company going out i mean i don't know how many flights he was on last year but it was probably twice as many as i was um but like so adam does all that and then for me mm -hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, first and foremost, I'm, I play bass and I sing, but, you know, I'm also the band leader uh, for no other reason that I just was the one that started handling all that stuff. You know, it's not because I'm the best musician, but, you know, I'm the guy that, you know, I'm uh, band leader slash tour manager because we're, we're a skeleton crew still. Mm -hmm. We don't have a massive tour support like, you know, Luke Bryan or anything like that. Those guys that are, you know, 30, 40 people in their crew. Um, <laughs> we're pretty small. Um so I, I wear these hats. And I, I mean, I'll drive the bus sometimes. And, and so we have um, a lot of work that has to get done. Um, and Adam and I trust each other that I'm going to go handle my stuff. And he's going to go out and do the best job he can to get this radio ad. And, you know, hopefully that we'll we'll go play a show there full band and say, hey, I mean, once they see us play, it's like, oh, well, Adam's got the voice in this band sounds great you know and that and that's you know that's kind of one of the that's what you want and then right but you know in between that you have you, you have to advance shows you have to make sure your payroll is getting done and, and so i you, you know there's a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that nobody likes to talk about the unglamorous part right. um and uh you know it all kind of stepped up to a bigger scale three years ago when uh you know everything started getting serious and so when we you know, from just paying each other, you know, after gigs, we just, you know, I'd write a check after, after a weekend of playing for a week and here you go. Well, now you, you know, you have to contact your business manager and they have to set up a payroll and then I have to go approve everything. And then, you know, a few weeks I'll get a report saying, Hey, you need to look over all these, uh, expenditure or, uh, this expense report and you have to approve everything. Like, wait a second, man, I came in the music business to play music. <laughs> I didn't get in here to, to do an expense report, but you have to do that stuff. And so man, I just did that, it. So yeah. yeah, just did it uh, this morning with an expense report and I did payroll two days ago and it's, <laughs> it's like, man, this is damn business now. I mean, it's yeah. I, what happened to just playing music. And I mean, I love doing it, man. I don't mind doing oh, it. it. Yeah. It's great. But people uh, but do have to step into that sort of role and, and, yeah. and it's almost like a leadership role too, you know, right. I mean, in some exactly. cases. So when you realize like, well, uh, I'm going to do this, what's it, it sounds like it was a little bit out of necessity, 
but right yeah you know like this has to get done and mm -hmm. i was like well it can't be that hard (laughs) and it's not it's it's you know again it's a learning curve you know so i didn't i didn't study business in college so you know some of these things it was like okay i gotta learn this i gotta learn this i gotta figure out how to do this um but you know, again, I learned it, and I have uh, our awesome management team. Our day to day manager uh, is a guy named Waylon, and and Waylon, you know, has been real awesome over the last year or so. Like, if I if I wasn't sure about something, hey man, I know I need to get this done, but I need some help, and yeah. he's he'll 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 throw me a bone and always help me out. Always super great guy. I mean, um, in all honesty, uh, some of the horror stories I've heard, it's almost a better thing that someone in the band is uh has their eyes on the money because but, people yeah. even sting got screwed out of millions of dollars by by a previous manager of his just yeah because you know, he, that we've person had, was in control of it all yeah we've had we had a situation um uh that that for whatever reason we you know it didn't end well for us with some things in the past and ended up having to pay out some money still having to pay out some money kind mm-hmm. of things um but you, again, learning from that, and it wasn't it wasn't millions and millions of dollars. It's a lot of money for us, for anybody. But it's it, it's not what it could have been. Um, and again, it's like um, okay, so you, you've heard this horror stories like you're talking about mm-hmm. bands. You know, you you get out on the road and you get a single out on the radio, and all of a sudden somebody's like, "Well, you need, you need a bus because image is everything. So you got to take oh, yeah. you got to run a bus, and you need this light system, and you need this, and you need a sound guy, and you need this, and." And, you know, all of a yeah. sudden you're like, yeah, OK, cool. Whatever's going to make this the coolest thing ever and make us look like we're some sort of badasses. And then at the end of the tour, uh, you don't have enough money to pay your your mortgage. Um, it's that's a re- it's a very real thing. And so very real. I mean, it was talked about in the uh, new edition by yeah. movie and uh, it's Emory a really guys com- have talked about yep. it. Um, it's a really common tale, man. And and. Uh, Again, you know, we we've always been so used to operating on a shoestring budget uh, that you know when we started doing things, and, and again, we've we've we have great management, and nobody ever pressures us to spend money on things we can't afford, you know. So, but we but we've got a bus. We have our we own our own bus, um, which is not something I'd recommend to most people because those things are kind of they can be kind of a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, if you if you don't have a, a, a I'm not a mechanic, but we we Adam and I and our keyboard player even have some uh, mechanical knowledge and you know there's been several times where I've had to crawl up under that bus and start <laughs> turning wrenches to get us to limp us home. I mean yeah. it's happened once or twice. You know it's it's, it's a good rig overall. But we've you know definitely had our issues. We've you know had to spend a lot of money on it to get it fixed and we've thankfully been able to save money because we've been able to do some things ourselves. So you definitely kind of have to know a little bit about. Uh, mechanics and some mm-hmm. electrical knowledge if you're going to get into ownership or something like that. But thankfully, we, we got a great deal on this rig. Um, it's got 12 bunks on it. It's got a front lounge. you got a bathroom, a little kitchenette. And, you know, Adam and I drive the thing everywhere. And um, it, it's it's done really great for us. But, I mean, it saved us even the money that we've had to spend getting it fixed. I mean, last year we had these turbochargers that went out. And it was an ungodly amount of money to get fixed. But, you know, Compared to uh, just a, a base figure, if you're going to go take a, a bus out for a weekend, say you're going to do a Friday, Saturday night show, um, a bus company is like, okay, we can give you this bus for three to five hundred dollars a day, give or take. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that five hundred dollars does not include your driver. <laughs> right. It does not include fuel. It does not include your cleaning fees. Your uh, your mileage fees for the wear you put on the engine, the wear and tear fees. Uh, so that, that, that weekend of taking a bus out for 48 hours is going to end up costing you $3,000 mm-hmm. when it's all said and done. If you, if your driver has to drive over eight hours, it's double his pay, you know? So and that's things you don't know about. So taking a bus is expensive. If you lease a bus, if you're doing a month long tour and you lease a bus, you can get the lease for the entire 30 days for about 10 grand. Again, it doesn't cost uh, pay for your fuel. That doesn't pay for your driver, uh, and there's still all the cleaning fees and everything associated with it. So, I mean, you're, again, at the end of that 30 yeah. days, 
you're looking at maybe thirty thousand dollars or more. Yeah. And and a lot of people don't realize that, but they have a manager who says, Okay, we got this bus, we got it for five hundred dollars a day, and we're gonna take it out for fifteen days. And some okay. people will tell them, and this is particularly in music, and this is mm-hmm. what I've heard Matt from Emory talk about is there'll be people saying, Oh, this is what you have to do mm-hmm. so that you look good, so that you look like a big deal and everything. So right. You know, it's easy for someone, especially if they're starting out or this is just happening to them for the first time and they don't know one way or the other right? Uh, So because they're not as experienced in that world. It's easy for them to fall for it and say, right. OK, oh, yeah. it's, it's just how that person is getting them wrapped around their finger so they can make money off of the band. Right. And it's easy for somebody to do that. Tell these people they need that when when those people aren't the ones spending the money. It's the, exactly. the artist at the end of the day that has to pay for that. And, and so this when is you, re- relevant to stand ups, too, because stand ups are going to stand ups tour. I mean, Tracy Morgan, he was on a bus when that terrible accident yeah. happened, you know, so and, like yeah. they're they're going to be touring on buses. So what's you know, what's a good idea here? Yeah. So, I mean, and, and you got to be once it's cost is not an issue for you and you can afford it and not worry about, man, if I got to do this many gigs just to break even, once that's not an issue, then yeah, you should have a bus. But, you know, it's one of those things that we've taken, you know, we, we've rented lease buses out this year um, when it was just too much for us to have to handle to drive ourselves. And like, if we had to get on a flight, somewhere else and you know we couldn't get our own bus back to nashville because we had to go out to to the west coast or whatever we, we'd we'd lease a bus but i mean it, it was a, it was kind of funny because you know we our, our bus it's it's an 08 it doesn't look like a regular bus it's kind of we call it the we call it the black pearl mm-hmm. uh some of the guys in luke bryan's camp call it the war machine because this big black burly looking thing it's not ugly but it's definitely like it's a it's a different looking rig <laughs> but it works i mean it's it's nobody's ever seen anything like it there's it's one of actually four i think that were ever built um by a company in nashville so there's only it's only four of its kind it's a kind of a cool thing but you know we we wear that name with the you know kind of a badge of honor because people see us when this when the crew sees us pull up, they're just laughing because they see me or Adam driving, and they're like, "God, these guys are just going after it." And you just it's, <laughs> and that's great. Oh, dude, I, I don't mind. It's not yeah. a big deal. It's it's again. It's like uh, you know, I wear all these hats of tour manager, band manager, a band bus leader, uh, bus driver. <laughs> I play bass. Man, you'd be thinking that God, if I got paid for all of those positions, I, I'd be I'd be doing pretty damn good. But. <laughs> But, and, and I get paid fine. I mean, it's, I'm not complaining about the pay, but it's like, you know, I do all of these things because I, I for me, I, I, the, my role is to make sure that we have longevity in, a, in our career. Mm-hmm. You know, Adam's doing what he's doing so that we can have a career that builds and not just something that overnight just shoots up. Uh, uh, you know, we have a number one single overnight and we're flying to the high and then all of a sudden it drops down. You know, you want that steady climb. You That's always true. want it to be faster. You always want to move to the next level quicker. But, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, we do things. We, we really an- analyze like, OK, what's the best way to do certain things? And, and you know, you have to look at money and you have to look at, you know, the benefit of doing this versus that. And, um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of musicians don't think about that. They just want to get out there and play and let people hear their music. And that's the most important thing, but you got to sit back and say, okay, you know, let me look at this because if we do this, uh, case in point, um, you know, if, if you're going to, we were just in Mexico and, and we didn't take the full band. We did an acoustic show. Um, well, for one thing, that's what the company wanted us to do. Secondly, you know, when you think about how much it costs to to get a full band down, to pay everybody, to how lodge everybody, I think it's really expensive. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, you don't you don't just want to break even. You right. know? So as much as you just want to play, you've got to think about your the business that's being operated. You know, in, in our case, the company is called Tenino Productions, which is. Mm-hmm a name from where Adam's from tonight Washington. And, you know, you, you want to make sure that there's money in the bank at the end of the year, you know, instead yeah. of being like, well, you guys hemorrhaged money yeah, and you're totally broke. So <laughs> that's not good. So we don't, we don't want that. So yeah, you, you definitely, so there's a pace that you all are. It sounds like you're taking to approaching, creating music, approaching the business 
And now, I mean, you're you're on a, a big label, and you just said you're you're touring. You've mentioned Luke Bryan a couple times. You guys were touring with Luke Bryan. Yeah, um, we were out on the Hunt and Fish and Love and Every Day tour last year. Um, we did about oh man, how many, I don't know how many shows we did with Luke last year. Twelve or fifteen dates. Uh, part of that tour, then we were we we did Mexico with him last year. We did Mexico with him this year. And we did a we did a private event or, or two here and there. Um, we have the same management company that mm-hmm. that that Luke does, and been real fortunate to be out with those guys. And uh, if you you know if you're not a fan of country music, I still say you should go see that show. It's really entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, as far as acts out there, one of the nicest group of people. I mean, it starts from mm-hmm. the top down. Luke's a super nice guy, but then. I've heard good things Every, about him as a man too. Outside yeah, of what you said, like he is, yeah, he's he I mean he's like a family a man, all that. Yeah, yeah um, but then the whole crew. I mean, just just amazing people, man. They they help us out out on the tour. They were really good to us. Um, you know, I, I made really good friends out there with with guys in his band, um, and then the, the, some of the guys on the crew from you know the the text to the the guitar text to the sound engineers and everything, and you know they they treated us you know, really, really nice and, you know, made us feel right at home. So that was a, that was a good feeling because you don't, you don't get that with every, every artist you play with or every group you play with. Sometimes you're kind of pushed to the corner and just kind of told to come out when you come out. But, you know, that wasn't the case with us. I mean, it was, you know, we get to hang out with everybody, everybody, you know, will give us a hard time about doing something (laughs) ridiculous or, you know, but they're also, you know, super nice. It just, it was, it was a great time. I can't say enough about that crew. I mean, really just some top notch crew, uh, and, Mm -hmm. and members of that band. Um, uh, uh, super fortunate to be able to be on that tour. I think every one of us would say the same thing. I mean, we, we had a great time. Good and people. I do know there was the tragedy that happened in Las Vegas. You all were performing on that show earlier that night on that very same show. Yeah, uh, um, uh, yeah. You went we, out. You weren't performing during the shooting, but uh, right. A couple of your bandmates were out watching that show because you had already performed. Yeah. Um, so that weekend had been uh, the farm tour. We were out on the farm tour with Luke Bryan's farm tour, and we were on the first weekend of the farm tour, and so. Uh, we had flown from uh, Iowa uh, to Vegas, and we and uh, it was a God, no sleep. Got into got to the airport at like three o'clock in the morning. Got on a plane. Got to Vegas. Uh, went straight to the venue. Played the show that afternoon. Um, and uh, yeah, everything was great. I went back to the hotel. I, was, I hadn't been asleep in like thirty hours. I've been up for thirty hours straight, I think. So um, I went upstairs. Our guitar player Nick. Uh, was in the room with me and I said, Hey, I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to relax for a minute. There was an after party going on later. And I said, I'll meet you at the after party. So I, as soon as I took a shower, I came back, I laid down and I fell asleep and I woke up to alarms going off and my phone was just blowing up. And, um, yeah, it, a, a really tragic night. I, I, I don't have, um, I don't have a, a, the sad part of my story is the fact that People, you know, that had that happened. That was a, it's an American tragedy, and it's yeah. not a yeah. story that's. That if it was me personally, just because I was there, I was in proximity. I might, yes, I had some friends in the in the crowd, and you know, their stories are way more intense than mine. Uh, I just remember looking out my window and trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Why is all why are these alarms going on? And and I see people running down the street. And I got, it was like what this this is weird. It was like twelve. What, what time was that? Uh, it was like t- uh, 10, 30, 11, 30. I don't remember. I can't remember what time I woke up. I just remember looking at my phone and I had like a barrage of text messages from the guys and the, there was an alarm actually going off in the room. And um, yeah, it was from then on from about that from uh, 11, 30 to, or 12, 30, whatever, whatever time that was to like six o'clock in the morning. It was just, we were up. Just I couldn't, it, it was surreal. We couldn't leave the hotel room. Um, and so we were, we were basically like, I, I called my wife and she, I woke her up and I said, look, I, you know, bef- before you wake up and see this, this is what's happening. And th- at this point, you know, we still didn't know, we, we knew that there was a shooting and we knew people had been killed. We didn't know the extent of it. Mm. Um, and, and we thought, 
um, from the text messages that I was getting from people that were in Vegas, they were saying that it was still happening. Uh, because people would, would run, 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 and stop and try to arrest, and then they'd see another crowd of people coming, screaming about a shooter. So for some people, they thought that the shooting was going on for an hour or more. Oh, you know, wow. Because they didn't know. Everybody, it was chaos. Um, uh, so we, we had no idea uh, that it had officially stopped. Um, you know, the first report that I heard was two people in, or dead and about 15 injured or something like that. And then within an hour, that number had like quadrupled to 20. And then an hour later, it was 40. And then uh, then almost at uh, the end of it, almost 60 people. And uh, man, it was it was tragic. A buddy of mine who's a keyboard player here in Nashville, his cousin was in the show and his is at the show, and his cousin ended up getting had got shot twice and. Mm made a full recovery but i mean yeah just a tragic thing that something like that could happen and and uh you know i i, I haven't talked about it much with outside of you know you guys my friends and, and my family um because you know for me when i got home there was a bunch of news cameras and um i think it was obvious where i was coming from for one thing there was a news crew standing at the gate uh, from the inbound flight from Las Vegas, which I thought was really inappropriate. Yeah. Um, uh, again, I, they wanted to interview. They, they talked to some of us and I just kind of was like, yeah, I don't, I'm just glad to be home. Just glad to be home and got downstairs. And of course, as soon as I see Nora and my wife, you know, I, I got real emotional. Um, glad to see my daughter, but you know, I knew that there were people, sons and daughters and husbands and wives that weren't, getting to go home and see their family again. And that's what really tore me up. You know, I was, I was, it was a little guilty because I got to do that. We all got to do that. All of my friends were coming home and we were all seeing our loved ones. And, um, that was, I had a hard time with that. Uh, Understand. and I think, I think, I think anybody would have a hard, you don't have to be there to have a hard time with that. Something like that. You know, that's, that's something that you don't understand it. I'll never understand it. Um, uh, I don't think we'll ever get closure from, you know, there was a shooting in Kentucky no, at a high yeah. school yesterday. Like, yeah. And there was you something feel- you said, and this is, this is part of the reason I brought it up. Cause I know it doesn't have anything to do with what we normally do in this podcast or what I was talking about with you previous to me bringing it up. But there was something you said to me at the time that I thought was a very profound point. And that well, was that, all- <laughs> well, it was that, <laughs> People are looking for a motive, but yeah. it doesn't matter because whatever the reason was, it's not going to be a good enough reason for this to have happened. Right. Yep. And that's um, that's I got off Facebook for a while just because of that. You know, that mm. all the conspiracy theories and everybody's trying to, you know, find you know, the second gunman on the grassy knoll type situation and all these all these theories about what it was or what it wasn't. And I'm just it, to me, it, it just that kind of stuff always makes me mad just because it doesn't matter. It, it, it does. It, it, if there was a second person or a third person involved, it would matter. But, you know, they're trying to find the reasons for, for why somebody could do this. And, and yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's yeah. Well, it's, the it's motive, gonna, motive knowing is the motive the isn't going to help us avoid this necessarily right you know and, and it's, it's not going to make us feel any better about it right uh, and and there's a very good chance it can make you feel worse because it could bring up all these kind of emotions but I, yeah ultimately you know so many people were affected by this in such a bad way that nothing nothing you could tell me about why that happened is would make me feel better about that. And that's any situation. I mean, a kid starts shooting innocent children at a high school. Uh, yeah. his motive is never going to be good enough to justify what he did. No. Um, no. and that's, that's, that's anything that anything, anytime that something like that happens, it doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a terrorist bombing or, or a, a kid going rogue and, and going to a high school and, shooting children uh it, it's never that kind of stuff it just never mm-hmm. it's never it doesn't make sense it's never good enough and um you know on top of that you can't let these really small moments in life 
small in the amount impact. of time that they the amount of time yeah. Yeah. And, yeah and the it seems like it happens all the time and and, and it while there it seems that you know more and more violence is going on i think it's because it's more uh accessible through internet now because you, you hear about these things in real time almost right real yeah time. we hear about it more and it's not necessarily happening more than yeah it did i think the world's in a yeah i mean the world's in a good place uh you know barring your political beliefs or what you think's going mm-hmm. on with the country you know i think i feel that um it's easy to let that stuff make you negative, feel negative, yeah, to act absolutely, negative. Absolutely, yeah. But I mean, the truth is, man. I, I, you know, I see it every time I go. I mean, I, 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 see, I see so much good in, in the world. You know, I have I, to believe that there's more good in the world than bad in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Though the internet does make it harder and harder <laughs> to believe. That. Yeah, it's, <laughs> screw the internet, man. It's yeah, because I mean, it's. I, I just get to do what I do, and and I get I get to make people feel good. If right. they're not having a good day. And, and, and that's it, the it, thing, you know, like you, there's so many nights where you and including that night where you brought where you were you got to be part of bringing that to people. Right. And that what that that joy that people got from from music through all those shows you did on that tour uh, was m- much more prominent and, and and happened much more than the bad thing that happened and i'm not right. trying to diminish the significance of of that tragedy but i what i am trying to say is that tragedy didn't happen as much as good happened right just for you uh, personally even you know like and even looking just at about that yeah look at the, i mean the people the heroes from that situation that were running back into the crowd and saving people i mean you there were amazing people uh in in that instance that risked their lives to go pull people out uh mm-hmm. that they couldn't get away and, and yeah that that guy ruined a night of happiness for for thousands and thousands of people um but what you can't let it do is take over the rest of your life you know you let it if you let that stuff control you like i'm never going out again i'm never going to another concert yes i think you should be cautious everywhere you go i mean there's always you know there are bad people out there there's a lot of great people mm-hmm. and you know we had a show that very next weekend and it's like, all right, we just got to get out there and do it. It's, you know, just, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to have a good time and we're not going to let this keep us from enjoying our career, enjoying our lives. Um, it's easy to let that stuff eat you up if you let it, but it's also, I think just as easy to accept that, Hey, I've got awesome people in my life. I've got good friends. I mean, you guys were calling me and checking on me. Um, not, not, not necessarily checking on me, but, you know, you know, I mean, God, we text each other in that yeah, group. Yeah, we talk a lot, yeah. All the time. And, you know, the fact that I have friends like that or we have friends like that um, is enough for me to go, man, this, this life is too is good. I mean, bad things happen. Sometimes yeah. you don't have money. Um, the bad but, helps us to realize what good is. Yeah. Oftentimes. And um, so, it, again, that doesn't diminish the bad, uh, but it does help shine the light on how good good is. Um, right. And, and, on t- and going back to, to that, and it's kind of tied into what, what we do as a career. Um, you know, you got to love what you do. You know, it's like you you know what it's like doing those comedy thing, doing the comedy stuff, you know, and, and the circuit can be such a grind when you're starting off doing four or five nights in a, a smoky room and, and we've played those smoky bars and sometimes you're just like, man, what are we doing? You've got to love it, man. You've got yeah. to love what you do and at the end of the day, you're like, okay, I'm, st- I'm doing what I love. I'm going to keep doing what I love because to me, this makes me happy doing this and, uh, you know, it's it's very similar, I think, um, for, for both of our careers Mm -hmm. that, um, it's okay to not make money in the beginning. (laughs) Um, I mean, eventually you want to have some sort of income coming in, but I mean, (laughs) if, if you're happy doing it and if, and if you're living a fulfilled life doing whatever it is you do, if you want to lay, if you're a bricklayer and you love laying bricks or carpentry, it doesn't matter. Life, Right. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I mean, and again, I love working with my hands too. So I love building things. I've got a garage full of tools because I'm obsessed with like working with my hands. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, sometimes I'm like, man, I, I think I'd be fine just you know working on houses for people because I love doing it. 
I mean, I still think I'll always play music, but uh, I mean, just live a fulfilling life, and whatever that is to you, it's different for everybody. You don't, right? You know, not everybody's gonna be on stage and and play an instrument, but I mean, right? You know, my mother has been a teacher for God forty five years, and still is contemplating whether or not she wants to retire because I, mean, right. I think she genuinely does love her job, <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, mom. It's time. It's time to relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and you have a great mom. So shout out I, to your mom. Hey, uh, mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to also uh, lighten the mood a little bit, since we were talking about that that tragedy. When I was I was talking to you one day, we when uh, we I think the last time we talked about it at length on the phone. I was actually standing in a grocery store. I didn't. I don't think I told you this. I think you only heard a little bit of this. But I was standing in a grocery store and I was like looking at cookies because I had a, I had a hankering for Oreos or something. <laughs> and I was just like staring at these cookies. But then um, you, uh, the conversation got really serious. So I was just like listening to you. But also in the store, this uh, mom and her like. Her young daughter, but her daughter was an adult, so she was like probably mm-hmm. in her 20s, are having this argument. <laughs> I just like heard her mom yelling like, you can maybe do that with your friends, but you can't do that with me. I'm your mother. And I was like, all right, I don't know what's going on. I'm just <laughs> listening to Jim right now. And then um, they like keep going on and I'm like tuning them out. And just like we got to a point in the conversation where it got real serious. So I was just like completely zoned out. I, I didn't know what I was staring at. And next thing I know, I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> next thing I know, I hear, I don't know. Let's ask him to stare some more. And I just, <laughs> I came to and I looked up and it was that the the mother staring right at me, angry. And yeah. I was, I have, I just happened to be staring in their direction or like facing in their direction. I had sunglasses on, so I wasn't actually staring <laughs> at them. But she was like, she just like threw her hands up and went, oh. And then said something to her daughter, like, you're paying the gr- for the groceries, and then walked out. And the daughter was just standing there, like, dumbfounded by this. And that was what I, the thing I think you heard was just like, hey, I wasn't staring at yeah. you all. <laughs> just on and the I was phone. Like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, too serious of a moment to be like, hey, Jim, this hilarious thing just <laughs> happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's what happened. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Crazy Golly. people in Brooklyn, man. Yeah, yeah, man. That's everywhere. <laughs> That's true. Um, so let's uh, wind the episode down. We've had a okay. really good talk. Um, yeah. I don't know what we could create, but maybe what you can advise people on is what it's like being in the music industry with a famous name of someone else who was in the music industry. Like if, if somebody else named Chris Rock were coming along and they weren't quite a stand up, but they were maybe a, a sketch writer and wanted right. to be on SNL. What, <laughs> it's, what, it's what tough, man. It, Cause, and it's not so much that, um, I, I think people generally understand that I didn't choose that name. That's, that's the name that I was given from, you know, right. when I was born. So I've always gone by Jim or Jimmy. Um, uh, unless my mom's mad at me and it's James, but um, <laughs> it's just my, that's my name. And I didn't choose that name, nor would I have chosen my name uh, to be that had I known I was going to be in the music industry. However, that being said, uh, people don't forget me. Typically, true. it's an easy name to remember. Uh, so it, I get I used to get a lot of flack for it. But now that people know who I am <laughs> a little more. It's just kind of the joke. Every nobody, every now and then somebody will call me Jimmy, but a lot of times it's Jim Hendrix, Hendrix, Jim Hendrix. You, know? yeah, yeah. you get a so it's it's it's, it's kind of a joke, but uh, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be initially. I thought it was going to be a big problem. You thought you were going to like, change your name? <laughs> yeah, I, th- I thought about it. I thought about yeah, going with honestly, my other. Even friend, if you went with James. Hendrix, people still would have been like, "Hey, that's kind of like Jimmy Hendrix." Like people yeah. still would have, because that's what I did. When there's I did. actually there's actually another Jim Hendrix in Nashville, and he's a bass player. Oh and my gosh! Funny story. So I actually met him uh, for the first time. We've both been in this town. He's been in actually. I think he's been in Nashville a little bit longer than me. He's a little older than I am by like a couple years. But um, I had, we had both heard that there was another Jim Hendrix. He spells his with a C K S. Um, and I'm with an X, 
That's the only just difference. Like, yeah, just like yeah, Jimmy. But, <laughs> but we had, um, I'd run into people and they're like, hey, man, I played with you in this band years ago. I'm like, nah, nah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that Christian rock band. I was like, you definitely didn't play in a Christian rock band with me, you know? Yeah, like, and how could they also confuse? Is he also 6'8? He's not. He is tall, and we have. Uh, I would. I would say somewhat similar features. T- tall, and and he's a lot leaner than I am. Like he's not. He's not. I wouldn't say he's built. He's not scrawny, but he's. I'm. I'm. I'm much bigger now, especially maybe maybe a few years ago when I was a lot skinnier <laughs> and wasn't hitting the gym quite as hard. Uh, we might have been a little more. But yeah, he's probably like six three. Anyway, uh, still. <laughs> we. Uh, I was in Washington State playing at a festival called Watershed at, at, at a event. Uh, a place called the Gorge out in Washington State, an amazing venue to play. And uh, we get done playing, and this guy comes up to me. He's like, "Hey, man, great job! You know, you sounded great. I'm a bass player too." He's like, I, "I really enjoyed what you were doing up there." I was like, "Awesome, man! My name's my name's Jim. Nice to meet you." He goes, "Hey, that's my name, Jim too." He's like, "But my name's Hendrix. That's what he said." And I go, "I just kind of looked at him. Like, that's my name." <laughs> and he he was he was bending over, getting something down. He looks up. He goes, "Man." I've been waiting to meet you for years. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, me too. He goes, what do we do now? Do we hug? I was like, yeah, I think so. I think it's appropriate. <laughs> so I like, I mean, I was like, dude, I've, you know, I've been, people have confused me with you thinking that we played in a band together. Uh, I don't know how they confused us, but I mean, I, I've, I've heard about you for years that you were the, there was another Jim Hendrix running around. He goes, man, yeah, me too. And then, uh, we talked for a little bit. I got his, I think I got his number and I shot him a text. Didn't see him again until the last year, this past year <laughs> at the gorge. He walks up to me again. It's been two years since I've seen this guy. And we happen to be at the same venue on the West coast, you know, big, big music festival. It's like, Jimmy. It's like, oh, dude. <laughs> so yeah, I seem to only run in the on the West coast. But didn't you meet somebody who, Later, you found out that she thought you were the Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, it was a, a young, very, she was very young. I think she was like 16, 15, 16. Um, I'm not going to say her name, but uh, <laughs> at the time, she was just really young. She didn't, she doesn't, she, she didn't know. know. Yeah. She knew the name Jim Hendrix or Jimi Hendrix, I'm sure, but she didn't know who Jimi Hendrix, the classic rock guitarist, was. Uh, <laughs> So she she met me and she had heard that name, so she assumed I was like super famous. <laughs> so like she went home, it's like, oh yeah, I got to meet Jimi Hendrix tonight. And, oh my gosh, she's like, yeah, man, that that guy's super famous. And like her, I, her because her parents told me about this, or her her uncle who was the owner of her label at the time told me about it. He's like, yeah, man, she totally thought that you know you were like the legit <laughs> like famous rock god Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> oh well. That's a that's a child for you. <laughs> yeah, I've forgotten about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there it is. Thanks so much for being on the podcast, man. Man, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to let little old me come on. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, the man himself, Jim Hendrix. Again, not that one. Thanks so much for listening. I, I am very thankful that Jim came on, especially... And uh, I'm thankful that he was willing to talk about the tragedy in Las Vegas. That was a serious subject, uh, but I, I think it was a good talk. I think it was fruitful, and I hope you gained something from that talk and the rest of the discussion as well. And you can find out more about the music he's a part of by going to adamcraigofficial.com. And, of course, there are links in the bio And you can get to social media accounts from the bio and from adamcraigofficial.com. And don't forget you can follow and like us on social media. Go to Facebook or Twitter and look up at There It Is Pod. I'm on Twitter at Jason Farr Jokes and I'm on Instagram at Jason Farr Picks. That's today's episode. Next week is a fun one. Until next time, be good to each other. The music for the theme song was created by Neil Brooks. The rap was written and performed by Nick Acevedo. The logo for There It Is was created by Jeff Prater. The There It Is podcast is produced by Jason Farr.